of Ali members, Simon's Rock students, and Monument Mountain students and staff. Uh, people can submit questions to the speakers on the 3 by 10 cards in their packets. Questions will be gathered at the end of the talk. It's my pleasure and privilege to introduce Anne M. Lashke. She is a historian of 20th century U.S. political culture. She teaches in the Departments of American and Africana Studies at UMass Boston and Boston University's writing program. She specializes in capitalism, democracy, sport, race, and gender. Lashke has recently published academic articles on U.S. political economy, diplomatic engagement, and athletes' immigration and also writes publicly for the Washington Post's Made by History column, The Conversation, Business Insider, and other outlets. She is revising her first book, Foxes, Not Oxes, Women's Athletics in American Political Culture, for publication. Title IX, the 1972 law mandating sex equality in American education is the subject of her second book project. Lashby came to her academic interest in sport as a runner, finishing the Boston Marathon and other races to counterbalance the stress of graduate school. She also rode horses, trained in dance, and competed in softball, basketball, and swimming during childhood. Diagnosed with epilepsy as an adult, she advocates for others in higher education particularly students who live with disability. Let's give a warm welcome for Ann Blaschke. Hi everyone, thanks so much for having me and thanks Brian for that introduction. I appreciate it. So, talking of that. All right, so um, this morning I'm gonna be talking about sport, race, gender, and politics. So I'm looking forward to hearing your guys' comments as well once I'm done. So um, let's see, in particular, I'm gonna be talking about a particular set of um, sex equality laws that were passed in the 1960s and 1970s. So we're gonna be thinking about how these laws restructured both work and education in the United States and what the impact of policies have been on U.S. athletes across race and gender. So while these policies have vastly broadened the opportunities to participate in both professional and amateur sport, I argue, such laws have also had unexpected ramifications. Not only did these sex equality policies continue to face legal challenges, they also offer Americans uneven benefits such as protection from sexual misconduct or equal financial resources, which often benefit men. In that light, I'll explain today, women athletes continue to fight to expand equality policies, purporting to treat the sexes equally and to reap the benefits of these laws. We now benefit from the leadership of the group I'm calling the Children of Title IX, the women and men, who came of age in the 1980s and 90s with lifelong educational access to post-1960s civil rights laws, as well as the innovations and demands of their own kids and grandkids. I'll begin by mapping out our analysis of gendered sports history today. First, we'll consider, whoops, sorry about that. First, we'll consider the current place of Americans' physically active lives in the US, Next, we'll move into the history of the two laws I'll be analyzing, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and Title IX of the Education Amendments Act of 1972. So, how many of you out there have heard of either of these policies or are familiar? Okay, let's see about half and half. Great. So, a big range. Hopefully, I'll expand on the knowledge base. Um, of those who are familiar with, the, um, with this legislation, and for those who are newer to these ideas, um, we'll be giving you some parameters to think about um, 
these laws for yourself, right? Because they affect all of this. Okay, so what were these laws? What were they meant to accomplish? And how did they affect us? So we'll be discussing the impact of these laws on males as well as females. But much of our conversation today will trace the history of women's sports. All right, so for the third part of my talk, we'll be using as case studies the category of sports known as team sports. So do we have any current or past athletes out there today? All right. Um, any fans of team sport? All right. <laughs> I thought there might be some takers. So there's a lot of familiarity with this type of athletics as opposed to just individual competition. Today we'll be using the sports of basketball and soccer, as well as a little bit of what's known as American football, as windows onto the laws that give all of us access to sports, but also constrain our participation in ways that we might not expect. So today Americans are arguably fitter than at any time in the nation's history. We live longer and we have more complex of more complex ways of practicing active lives than ever before. However, while most American children grow up with at least some exercise due to school programs, um, being physically active is getting more privatized and more expensive, leading to a more exclusive culture around being fit. Some examples of this are found in the vast fitness regimes and what's called the wellness cultures in America, such as yoga, CrossFit, Soul Cycle. These group fitness types give Americans more opportunities, more variety to find fitness and enlightenment, but they do so in often exclusive ways with their high prices and expensive apparel. Think of Canadian yoga outfitter Lululemon um, with its hefty price tags um, and controversial social place on the market um, as just one example. So while sports have followed this line too of becoming more unaffordable, um, thanks to specialized training camps and club teams with hefty fees, as well as the big prices for equipment that parents tend to take on in order to afford these, these things for their kids. Um, while sports have become you know, less affordable and therefore harder to enter, the demographics of who can play sports has also hugely increased, as the slide shows. So, are any of you guys familiar with any of these athletes? Do you recognize any of these folks? <laughs> awesome. Okay, so here we have Olympian Lori Hernandez, starting from that side, whose family is of Puerto Rican descent. Simone Biles, the most decorated gymnast in U.S. history, a woman of color raised by her grandparents. Naomi Osaka, a tennis pro of Haitian and Japanese descent, who competes for Japan, but has lived in the U.S. since age three and Serena Williams, Grand Slam champion many times over, who learned to play tennis on the courts of Compton, Los Angeles, and has been celebrated for her success, even as she's also been criticized as too black, too muscular, and too strong to be an appropriate woman. Um, we've seen this just over and over again. So even 20 years ago, this diversity uh, of race, races, ethnicities, and the cultures they represent would have been much less likely in these hefty price tag sports, right, that originated particularly in the case of tennis um, in a country club environment. All right, so the laws that led to um, equality for professional women at work, after all those women we just saw, um, they're all paid for their athletic abilities at this point. So these laws began um, with one piece of legislation passed six decades ago, the Civil Rights Act, which you can see President Lyndon Johnson signing here. You'll probably notice that civil rights activist Martin Luther King stands right behind the president, and, his, and this speaks to the law's most famous achievement, outlawing racial discrimination in public places, if you think of um, water fountains, gas stations, uh, the upper balcony of the movie theaters are some famous examples, or infamous examples. But the Civil Rights Act also has other provisions, and one of them deals with employment discrimination. Title VII, a hotly debated part of the law uh, at the time in Congress, prohibits employment discrimination of workers based on race, color, national origin, religion, and sex. 
The law also created a watchdog agency, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, to enforce it, and it allows workers who endured workplace discrimination to file claims against their employers. But women workers began to notice almost immediately that the EEOC almost never responded to their complaints against sexist boxes, um, bosses. So this is in the 60s. While the agency began taking seriously the complaints of racial discrimination, which is great, it mostly ignored females across race. So women at work decided to create an advocacy group to lobby Congress and to defend their new right to workplace equality. The National Organization for Women, which is usually known as NAP. The organization pressured the EEOC to uphold the law and it began taking the cases. But despite new laws protecting marginalized workers, it didn't offer protection in education and many private organizations, such as the Boston Athletic Association or the BAA, home of the famed Boston Marathon, continued to discriminate on the basis of sex, forcing athletic women, in their view, to become activists. So here's one of the barrier breakers, Syr um, Syracuse University student Catherine Switzer, who trained for the marathon with the Syracuse men's coach because there was no women's team. And she entered using just her initials. Um, women weren't allowed, but this way she got on the roster. So you can see here how um, marathon director Jack Semple reacted as she ran the race. Um, she tackled her. She finished the race, though, and her success forced the <coughs> to open the marathon to women. So in Switzer's marathon, she also proved that women could run long distances um, without doing two things um, about which doctors had worried since the late 19th century. Um, she didn't damage her reproductive organs, um, and she didn't physiologically become male in any way from running the Boston Marathon, and these have literally been um, issues that the observers had been concerned about. Um, this also didn't um, change her sexuality or her sexual preference in any way, and this was another common specter at this time in women's sports. All right, um, that participating in education and sports for women might cause same sex. Louder, or else it was my Okay, sorry, um, I sound really loud to myself up here. So, um, but another specter of this, which of course didn't happen to her, was that sport caused her to um, develop same sex attraction where she had not felt this before. All right, so she just proved a lot of common stereotypes that had existed for you know, decades in the United States. Is that better? You guys hear me? Okay. So the law that would bring sex equality to Switzer and other women like her, um, and really to American education, is Title IX um, of the Sex, or sorry, the Education um, Amendments Act of 1972. So Title IX revolutionized the opportunities um, of both male and female students, um, staff, and faculty at schools from kindergarten all the way through grad school. So here at Bart Simmons Rock, for example. All right, so the text of the law is pretty simple. It just reads, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. A bipartisan Congress passed Title IX um, and a Republican president, Richard Nixon, signed it, and, um, and they all felt positively about it at the time. Um, there was some debate, but this did pass, so you can see that there are some differences between even that turbulent early 1970s um, sort of American orbit and our political moment today. Um, but a few of the architects of Title IX you can see here, so down front, we have the inspiration for the law. Um, Bunny Sandler, um, a graduate student and aspiring professor who in the 1960s um, was barred from equal access to employment at a college and therefore started researching what she saw as a loophole in the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So she discovered that it doesn't cover education and therefore she decided to pursue new legislation that did. 
All right, so the people who supported her in particular were um, U.S. Representative from Hawaii, Patsy Meek. Um, you can see they're running for re-election. And um, Indiana Senator Birch Bay. So you can see him there with the Purdue women's track team in 1974. He was the fiercest male advocate of Title IX in Congress until um, his retirement. Okay, so Title IX revolutionized all kinds of access to new opportunities in schools. So, let's see. <laughs> I'll leave her up. All right, so a lot of new opportunities. So I'll give you a few examples. So males, American guys, were welcomed um, en masse into programs that they'd been discouraged from entering previously. So the arts, a wider variety of majors, while females um, gained access to a huge range of programs from which they had been locked out. Um, so the hard sciences, economics, Grad school programs such as doctorates in history, like the one I was um, fortunate enough to get, access to medical school, entrance to law school, women had been denied all of these or accepted only, other, only under very restrictive quotas. All right, um, and of course, athletics. So sport is not in any way, um, especially written into Title IX. The reason that it became associated with Title IX so strongly is that this was basically the area in which women had the furthest to go. So few women were allowed to compete in sports um, that there was just an absolutely vast gap. All right? So therefore, in order to achieve equity um, and basically leap females forward, a very strong sort of upsurge um, created controversy and a lot of excitement. Okay, so women's first forays into sports gave new attention to individual athletes, um, as the slide just showed you. We move into an era of individual stars. Um, the best example of this phenomenon is probably tennis player Billie Jean King, who founded a women's tennis tour to fight unequal pay in professional tennis when she realized men were being paid more. And she beat self-described, quote, chauvinist pig Bobby Riggs in the Battle of the Sexes in 1973, which became the biggest um, mixed sex or women's sports event in US history to that point, with over 40,000 spectators in the Houston Astrodome and millions of Americans watching on television. But perhaps Title IX's more profound advancement for women's sport has been the development of team sports. A key example of this revolution is basketball. The women had played on small private teams since the late 19th century. Modern women's basketball was a more aggressive physical game with elite training and international competition. Title IX forced schools to increase their funding. And um, Tennessee Wonderkind Pat Summit is an example of this as a pioneer in women's basketball. So Title IX failed to trickle up in substantive ways to women's sport throughout her college career. And she remembers sleeping in gyms, all of the women athletes washing their own uniforms, um, and driving themselves to meets rather than getting bus access, let alone shower access. But nevertheless, incremental change um, she did benefit from. And you can see her here. Um, she was a University of Tennessee champion, and she took um, the first Olympic women's basketball team to the 1976 Olympics, and went on to become a legendary coach at UT, coaching national teams to gold medals, and winning more national championships than any school, except her biggest rival, the University of Connecticut. UConn demonstrates the light years that women's collegiate sport grew in the late 20th century. Two people here showcase this change, coach Gino Oriema, who's driven the team to unprecedented success, but also embodies an unanticipated result of Title IX, the shift of coaching of women athletes from female to male coaches. As men, these coaches, as well as male executives, earn more on average than women, effectively increasing girls' opportunities to play but slashing women's opportunity to be leaders after they graduate. The other key figure here is UConn phenom Brianna Stewart, whose virtuosity shocked opponents and earned her, as a professional player, 
the nickname, quote, the LeBron James of basketball. By 1996, Title IX had produced the first generation of Americans who had access to sport since childhood. Dubbed the children of Title IX, this generation saw the results of the law in enough numbers of elite women athletes that professional teams either formed or gained traction for the first time. In basketball, sport executives sought to capitalize on these increased numbers of athletes and created the WNBA to offer post-collegiate players a competitive chance and ideally to drive um, a new competitive market. All right, um, so the next sport we're gonna be looking at is soccer. So women's soccer is the other team sport for which Title IX enabled a new generation of talented players. It quickly became apparent that while men's soccer has struggled and did at that time to compete at the global level, women's U.S. soccer had received the training and funding to dominate internationally. Here you can see the first generation of players to win a FIFA Women's World Cup. The U.S. women continued this dominance at the 1996 Atlanta Olympiad. Player Mia Hamm, you can see there, embodied the appeal of women's sport that Americans had embraced two decades after Title IX. She's white, she's ponytailed, she's conventionally beautiful, and she was the most aggressive player on the pitch. Little girls collected her photos while their dads appreciated her femininity and admired her posters in their daughters' rooms. In 1996, American women won the gold medal and catapulted into popular culture despite the fact that the final received minimal television coverage, which really speaks, I think, to the lack of coverage of women's team sport that continues to hamper the financial viability and thus the professional survival of women's team sport. But the real coming of age for the children of Title IX came in 1999, when the US women's team won the World Cup. When Brandi Chastain drilled in the winning shot, the packed stadium erupted and she ripped off her shirt in triumph um, in a gesture familiar to probably many who have watched men's soccer. So this is a common post-goal move. Her action um, captivated Americans. Some admired her top physique and her no-nonsense sports bra, while others disdained her body as inappropriate and mannish. <laughs> the name um, absolutely happened to the 99ers as they've um, become known sparked mass interest in women's soccer, leading to a new professional league, but that league faltered and shut down after several years. A new one has since revived due to lack of a living wage for the players and any promotion of them in sports media. In the new millennium, sports has become increasingly visibly political, but the history of men's and women's political engagement in sport is long and often concerns discrimination. Um, uh, additionally, I would just say that the US government, um, from Theodore Roosevelt to today, has very clearly intervened in sport, um, from the creation of the NCAA um, to a host of other um, ties to the military in all kinds of ways. So the federal government has basically always been active in sport. Um, sport is defined as political for the most part when athletes also weigh in on politics, all right? So how we define in po um, politics and sport, right? I think is an interesting way to engage in this conversation. Okay, so the history of men's and women's um, political engagement is long on the athlete side. But male athletes have traditionally blocked women from participating in their protests, preferring to conflate masculine um, protests with social arguments for equality. So just one example of this attention to men's sport protest is the activism of NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick, who first began sitting and then kneeling for pregame national anthems in 2016 in response to the high mortality rate of black men during altercations with police officers. While professional basketball players, as you can see here, had also protested police brutality, Kaepernick caused an unprecedented roar um, uproar because, I would argue, he dared to protest in the most conventionally masculine, popular, and profitable American sport. In his protest, race and gender conflated to come across not as an expression of the First Amendment, of the right to protest, but instead as an unpatriotic act. 
His protest caused an uproar in the NFL, and fans both for and against his protest began boycotting games. While the league officially ruled against sanctioning Kaepernick, he was unofficially blackballed um, and continues to be by owners. Despite all the attention male athletes who protested have received, women athletes who protested these exact same dynamics have received um, almost no public attention. Um, even if they have commanded some more control over their leagues and their fans' reactions. So one quick example, WNBA, um, women's Black Lives Matter protests, um, basically for the same reasons as Kaepernick. Um, their protests were so unequivocal and so widely embraced by the players in the league um, that executives who had initially penalized the women for protesting basically had to rescind um, their sanctioning of their athletes, all right? Or no one would play. Okay, so the fans both largely supported their protest um, and also their overt embrace um, of a sexuality spectrum and the presence of lesbian players um, on teams. Women's soccer player Megan Rapino experienced similar support among US soccer fans um, when she became the first white woman athlete to take a knee in 2016. When U.S. soccer did compel athletes to stand for the anthem in response to this move by her, she adapted by, she now stands with hands at her sides and um, refuses to sing. In her rationale, she conflates interlocking systems um, of oppression, so different ways that groups of people have felt marginalized or been exposed to less. She conflates this with an empathy for those she sees as oppressed, as you can see here. While women athletes' protests failed to gain notoriety, these did not make much of a wave in the media, um, President Donald Trump's rebuke of male protesters shows the extent to which there's a gender difference. People seem to care more about men's sport and therefore about men who protest on the playing field. All right? Um, so Trump, you can see here, um, has spoken out a number of times um, about his frustration with um, male activism on the football field. Okay? So um, I think he, his reaction um, shows the extent to which black male protest, particularly in the nation's most popular corporate sport, has alarmed many white males. And the reason I give that broad description is that we've seen this you know, from the wealthiest um, white owners who um, are in charge of these teams to um, fans across the socioeconomic um, spectrum who fit into that demographic. All right, so Trump, however, targeted not only the majority black NFL players, but he does something different. So he also attacks the nearly all white male ownership, which is something very different. So he argues that they mismanaged their dissident employees, and in so doing, he sparked the only mass protest across race and labor management, which is key, that the NFL has ever seen. Okay, so this is absolutely unprecedented um, on the US political sport landscape, and you can see here just the extent of the reaction and how remarkable this is. Um, so meanwhile, the increasingly diverse U.S. Women's Professional Soccer League evaluated the second-rate payment and facilities, the resulting injuries they suffered um, of their league in comparison to men's soccer and filed suit against um, the U.S. Soccer Federation they employ. So the way that they filed suit, how did they do it? Um, they used Title, um, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. So this shows their awareness of historic civil rights law as well as their willingness to take radical stances against pay and equity, all right? Um, they threatened to boycott the 2019 World Cup, which they were largely expected to win and did, if initial concessions were not granted them. And after they won, they continued to move forward with their suit, which is going to trial in 2020. Um, and you can see them here after their win. Okay, the women's soccer team has garnered, I think, unprecedented media attention for women's sport 
because of their talent, but also their unabashed confidence in their own abilities and in their teammates. While millions worldwide admired their pride in their own success, others have criticized the women as arrogant showboats. As you can see the UK's paper, the Daily Mail, doing so here. Um, so think Alex Morgan, um, miming, um, having a cup of tea, taking this sort of arrogant um, or confident sit after scoring, or Megan Rapinoe's audacious pink hair, statements against the policies of both FIFA and Donald Trump, um, and her joyful gesture of I think, dominance as she revels in crowds' cheers after scoring goals. So the women's team has continued with their openly political approach to team sport um, in 2019 this summer when they unequivocally refused to visit the White House had they been invited. Um, so we have on the one hand a lack of issuing invitation, we also have a refusal to attend. So this refusal to accept um, the honor and dignity of a sitting president, president had that been um, an option, was a real stark departure from women's soccer team's past trips um, to a number of different presidential White Houses, including this 2015 celebration with President Barack Obama complete with selfies. All right, so their reaction is something that we hadn't seen them take on in um, either Republican or Democratic administrations in the past. So today, how do women's teams force us and offer us the freedom to see gender roles differently? In addition to their demands for workplace equality and political agency, these women, I think, challenge the traditional overtly feminine aesthetic that female athletes have historically adopted or felt they had to adopt in order to avoid charges of mannishness or homosexuality, charges that used to function negatively as insults, ways to discredit women as competitors. So these women um, have really fueled um, the sort of rise, I think, of designer sportswear on the one hand, if you think of like the Nike Off-White collaboration with Virgil Abloh, um, the regular wearing of brands like Gucci um, on and off the pitch. Um, but in addition to making maybe sportswear a little more glamorous, um, if unattainable to all of their fans, um, they have also, I think, brought a new kind of comfort um, and hipness to sneakers rather than high heels, to sweats rather than suits, um, and almost made this a kind of proto-business attire that's really interesting, and just as you know, male sportswear has really, and that kind of swagger, has really evolved into mainstream fashion, um, we also see, are seeing the same thing now on the women's side, okay? Um, so the adoption not just of leggings or tight revealing clothing, but, you know, baggy sweatsuits from Nike um, or Balenciaga as something that's framed as cool and comfortable. Okay, so innovations in fashion, even ones that make sport or continue to make sport um, exclusive. All right, they also really argue, I think, that androgyny can be womanly. All right, so refusing to wear dresses, to wear makeup all the time and to adopt this kind of code of heterosexuality or femininity that um, previously um, women athletes almost always felt they had to put on in public. All right, so one way to think about this is in the 60s and 70s, women track and field athletes um, literally weren't allowed to talk to the media. Um, their coach wouldn't let them if they weren't wearing lipstick. Um, which, so in order to do this, they had to run to the sidelines, comb their hair, grab their makeup, put it on, and then they could do their media interviews, all right? So this is the polar opposite of that, okay? Um, so a range of sexualities, um, a number of the women on the US team are gay, um, a range of sexualities as utterly acceptable, completely normalized, and on the one hand, worth conversation, on the other, so accepted that it's simply taken as part of the dynamic. Right? Um, and lastly for this slide, we also see women athletes refusing to settle what certainly are fewer sponsorships um, from corporate companies and less media coverage than men. 
So this has led multiple players to become upstart entrepreneurs, um, creating their own brands and upending fashion in the process, all right? Um, hopefully inflating their pocketbooks, but also challenging our cultural assumptions about what's cool um, and what, you know, appears to be success. Okay, so you can see a couple more examples here um, of players in the WNBA, players on the U.S. women's national team. So where do we go from here? Um, that's as much a question for you all as for me, I think. So one thing we can see if we trace these policies, um, so there's been a big impact. So there is vast opportunity to move forward in sport um, because of the backing of these federal policies that were created decades ago. All right. Um, so moving forward, the future, I'd argue, is limitless um, for sex equality law and the benefits it could offer both males and females. Um, all right, we can also see, looking at all of these athletes, from LeBron to Rapino, um, we can see the costs and benefits of using sport um, to advocate for any given cause, um, but particularly for um, civil rights, um, for the right to free speech, um, for the right to equal pay, um, or any other um, cause near and dear to their hearts, right? You can also see that they continue to spark emotional reactions from U.S. politicians, from fans, and from, let's say, basically corporate leaders. All right, um, these reactions aren't always negative. If you think of the 2018 Crazy Enough or Dream Crazy campaigns from Nike, um, right, enormously popular commercials which drove the sales of Kaepernick's jersey um, up by millions of dollars. Um, worldwide. Um, here we see Nike embracing um, Kaepernick and putting him forward as a kind of iconoclast, right? So on the one hand, this seems maybe like a financial risk, um, but I would argue that it actually fit into Nike's classic branding um, from the 70s and then especially in the 80s um, with the debut of the Air Jordan. They've always framed themselves as coming from behind as the underdog and is representing um, a sort of dissident, upstart character in athletes. Um, but ironically, they're, of course, one of the most successful corporate brands the United States has ever seen, um, multi-million dollar conglomerate, um, on the global stage, not just the American stage. All right, so here's a company that's been able to use an athlete's, um, I think, political stance um, to their own benefit. Okay, so we see this across race, ethnicity, and gender. Um, politicians putting forward one policy, athletes responding, and then that perhaps catching for politicians again, as we've seen with Donald Trump. All right, so lastly, I would say U.S. women's sport in the U.S. has often tended to be a bellwether for change internationally, and we've really seen this with soccer. Um, as the U.S. women have gone far out of their way to advocate for women's soccer players in Jamaica, um, in the Middle East, in, um, in Europe, and other places where players are underpaid, um, not taken seriously, okay? So the US team has enormous power to start these conversations and move them forward in other parts of the world, really showing the impact of globalization and the role of the US still, I think, as a leader on the sports stage. Okay, so lastly, where do we go from here? Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'll take us back real quick. So I'm not sure how clear this is, which maybe speaks to the point, but you can see, I think, how, on the one hand, controversial perhaps, but how popular um, these women athletes are today who do go out on a limb to make these dances. So for example, um, these are Instagram posts from last week. You can see here two little boys um, who dressed up as their heroes for Halloween, Alex Morgan and Megan Rapino, and their parents who then tweeted those athletes and um, hit them on Insta right away to share this news, all right? So because those athletes have such a huge following, millions of people have seen these posts and others like them, all right? So the vast popularity of these athletes um, for both little boys and little girls, I think bodes well, 
for the future, all right? Um, for many years, girls have looked up to male athletes because they had no one else to look for, um, and we've really seen that picture start to change. Okay, um, so one final, I think, saldo on this point is um, the fact that women's sport is now so entrenched and so popular, so accepted, even though women athletes are not paid as much as men, that, um, that sons you know, are now looking up to their mothers as the athletes on the field um, whose post-game um, post victories they can celebrate. All right, if you think of watching an NFL game, um, it's common for players to pick up their little kids, pose for those championship pictures, embrace their girlfriends or wives on the field. With the U.S. women's national team, um, we see players running to the sidelines to embrace their husbands and their boyfriends, yes, but also their girlfriends. Um, and doing this as though it's no big deal. Therefore, I think shifting the national conversation about equality in this way, in a way that we haven't seen in men's sport, um, all right, which tends to be much more circumspect about, um, about a range of sexuality or sexual preference. Okay, so I'll sign off here with um, U.S. forward Jessica McDonald celebrating with her seven-year-old son, um, who does consider her his hero, all right? So a bright future, hopefully, for women's sport. Thank you so much. to overcome for women 
who emerge to emerge as coaches in women's and men's sports and at managers and executives? Great question. Um, I think on the one hand that in terms of free marketeering, organizations need to hire more women, they need to mentor more women, just the same as they do men, um, coming out of sports management programs. Um, and I think that there needs to be more incentive to drive women into these sports um, in areas from journalism to coaching to um, being a sports trainer, athletic, um, any kind of management. All right, so fostering those programs from the ground up, I think is, is a good example. Um, a lot of colleges, for example, I was at College of the Holy Cross until very recently, um, there's an intense amount of, not exactly pressure, but kind of, um, on male athletes in lacrosse, for example, who play for the school to, um, to think about going into finance. And there are all kinds of networks, the football team too, that the school has arranged. Um, for students to ring the NASDAQ bell in New York um, to meet male executives who then look for them when they send in internship applications. I think there need to be those same levels of outreach um, in terms of sport for women, right? Um, from fostering, from fostering um, sort of business relationships to you know, simply putting women at the table, encouraging them to participate. I'll see if this makes sense. Uh, if men's tennis draw, draws larger attendance, there are generate more. Okay. Uh, if women's sports um, are so popular, then why do they have such small coverage? Well, I mean, <laughs> I think there's a broad perception um, on the part of media executives that um, you know, fewer viewers, fewer viewers will tune in, therefore fewer viewers will watch advertisements, um, and therefore fewer advertisements will fund these programs. Um, in reality, what we know is there is significant and even intense um, American interest in sport, and that oftentimes when women's sport is sort of lifted out of the ghetto of, um, and I admire this channel, but women are specifically blocked off most of the time into subsidiary channels of media like ESPN2 or ESPNW, a women's ESPN, rather than just featured in prime time, um, whereas you know, the NFL in concert has um, added new nights that it plays over time, um, you know, increasing players' exposure just to dynamics like CTE at the same time that it deprioritizes the viewing public's ability to watch women and therefore become fans of women's sport, all right? Will women's professional sports, basketball and soccer, ever be considered on an equal footing with the NBA and the major uh, soccer league? That's a great question. So um, women's soccer in the United States, as you might know, is, um, you know, technically in terms of talent, um, and in terms of their success on the international stage um, is, is much more successful than men's soccer. Um, but the private leagues, basically the, the clubs in the United States that women get to play for when they come home from the Olympics or the World Cup, their opportunities to do this um, are much smaller. The leagues are more vulnerable I think because they're funded less. And, um, Women's soccer has gone through several efforts to have a club league. Um, right now, they're sustaining one, but I think um, you know that for women's soccer to be on an equal footing with men's soccer, um, we need not just to be able to access women's soccer games on you know sort of um, expensive and hard to access versions of Hulu. Um, right, are sort of filtered off into some other way to watch women's sport. It needs to be on everyday access TV, um, just the same as men's sport is. Um, same with basketball. Let's say the WNBA has trouble reaching a large audience. Um, I think if more people had the chance to watch women's basketball um, and more cities promoted the teams that they have, then viewers would see that um, women are able to play a highly physical game. There's often a perception among people who don't watch women's basketball that it's, quote, less physical, um, that it's boring, um, and that the women, you know, aren't dynamic 
if you watch a women's game and the, the talent of someone like Brianna Stewart, for example, and other players who do dunk, um, in addition to all kinds of other really creative, exciting um, things that they do, I think that would drive a lot more fans and then that might put the league on a more equal footing to the NBA. I have one final question. Comment on women with high testosterone and limitation on competition. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. Um, so both in terms of intersex athletes and um, women athletes with high levels of testosterone, I think it's complex. Um, I do think the way that in the past um, doping commissions and the US Olympic Committee, among others, um, has been highly humane um, or highly inhumane. Um, with women being forced to submit to painful, um, basically pelvic exams before being allowed to compete, um, whereas men have not even had to be tested. All right, and today men's testosterone is not tested, whereas women, you know, still face these questions about routine gender testing. Um, so I do think that this is an issue that, you know, we as experts and as viewers um, and the athletes themselves need to research as much as possible um, and move forward really thoughtfully about. Um, most of these athletes don't even know that their testosterone levels are an issue um, or that they have any kind of male or masculine traits in the very few cases of people who do um, until they go through this testing process. Um, and then they're oftentimes vilified by the media in ways that I think inarguably are cruel. So yeah, I think moving forward, the more science we have, the more empathy we can bring to the conversation, um, and the more fairness, you know, in terms of things like races, for example, or sprints. Um, the more we can do that in a nuanced way, I think the better off that we are moving forward further into the 21st century with this conversation. Thank you very much, Anne. At OLLI, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College, enjoy learning simply for the love of it. Educational partners Williams College, BCC, Bard College at Simons Rock, and MCLA provide some of our outstanding faculty. Take a class in the arts, history, literature, and so much more. Contact OLLI today. Meet new friends. Keep your curiosity alive.